before we talk about having kids, <clears throat> let's just talk about how we get there. There comes a point, and we're all men, so we can talk casually. You look around you, Chris, and you see your friends holding hands with someone. And I think biologically, organically, psychologically, we are the sort of animals that we enjoy the company of others. We enjoy intimacy. And one of the nice things about intimacy is that we get to see our own reflection, who we are, what we are, and the other person. So, you know, if you happen to enjoy thinking and reflecting, what happens is you look for someone who has the patience to sit back, look at us, listen to us, and in listening, it's an act of worship. And you feel as if you're worthy of being worshipped, that you have some things very interesting or special to say, and it may be true. And so little by little, as you spend time with this person, and you become the center of his or her attention and focus, you feel special. And the relationship feels special. And there comes a time where this person looks at you and says, I'm in love with you. Now they really, really worship you. And they submit themselves physically to you, intellectually to you. And so if they have questions, they come to you. If they want to go somewhere, they ask you if it's worth going it's a very, very special and a unique place to be. It doesn't matter how reflective you are. It doesn't matter if you, your life is superficial, hollow, meaningful, or meaningless. Because everybody, hopefully, at certain times in their life, experiences, you know, love. And it's a very transformative experience. It's beautiful. It doesn't last, but it's beautiful, nevertheless. Then um, you get used to the fact that when you go home, this person is waiting for you. When you guys are having food or want to have food, he or she sits in the kitchen or stands in the kitchen and cooks. And it's it just everything feels so special. It's just you and her going to Home Depot or going to Zachary's or going here, going there. And you are the center of her attention as she is the center of your attention. And that gives you value as a human being, that your value goes up, and it gives her value. You know, especially if the relationship happens to be physically and emotionally monogamous, that you choose her over everyone else as she has chosen you over everyone else. There comes a point, and, you know, add to the fact that this thing called love really just happens to us. It's not like, you know, like buying a car where you go look at 50 different cars, and then you look at your bank account to see how much money you have saved, and how much your rent is, and how much your food is every month, so you can buy a car that you can afford. We don't really calculate like that when we go out and meet someone and hoping to get married or fall in love with them. We don't examine our resources. We don't examine the other person's resources. Because the truth is, some people like cars are like gas guzzlers. You know, some people are trucks, 18-wheelers. They take too much fuel. They go very, very slow. And it's because they have some trauma inside them. You just need to pay them attention every single day. They scream, they shout, they throw temper tantrums. And really, it's like you have to kind of hold them every single day to make them move, to make anything work. And it's a lot of work. But, <clears throat> you know, initially what happens is because you happen to be somewhat reflective and this person has a lot of questions, 
you assume, of course, wrongly always, that just because they're asking questions and because they talk about change and transformation and overcoming certain habits, that they actually are in the right place in life to take everything you're saying to them as a recipe so they can go somewhere and cook the, the data or information you're giving them. And after a while, when the relationship becomes a bit more casual, uh, you know, your words are dismissed. For the most part, you are dismissed. And then you realize, oh God, this is, this is such an awful place to be. Yet now, because you're in a relationship, you feel guilty for telling them you no longer want to be with them. Okay? That you want to break up with them. You want to walk away and just find freedom, breathe some air. So oftentimes when we get in ourselves into relationships, we really don't look at the other person's history. We don't look at our own history. We don't really know what their capacity is, and we don't really know what our capacity is. We just hang out with someone, and time creates history. History creates events. Events create emotions. And if the emotions happen to be somewhat positive, after some weeks or months, you just look at them and say, I love you. Now, on the positive side, let's just say everything about the relationship is good. That there is no trauma inside this person. There is no trauma that you have. And um, you have won it for the past 25, 30, 40 years, and it's gone relatively well. And you're saying to yourself, well, maybe I should have a child of, you know, won it for the past 40 years. It's gone well. I found myself a nice companion. Maybe I can continue wonging, you know, this, and I can have a child and be a great father or mother. Initially, both for the father and the mother, it's a fantastic place to be, that you get the news. I mean, it comes with a good amount of fear and confusion and doubts. But nevertheless, the, the idea of becoming a father or becoming a mother, they are far too fantastic for you to kind of remove yourself from these intense emotions, sit back and say, huh, what does it really mean to be a father? What does it really mean to have a child? You don't think about those things. You just want to be a father or she just wants to be a mom. And then when she misses her cycle and she takes the test and she tells you that she's pregnant, both of you, to some extent, are extremely happy. And let's just say you live in a two-bedroom or a house. You go to Home Depot, you buy a bucket of paint. If it's a girl, maybe pink. If it's a boy, maybe gray or blue. You go to Target, you buy sheets, you buy toys buy cribs, buy all sorts of things. You look at the newspaper to see if you can find any coupons for diapers, for formula. And then she's like seven or eight months pregnant. Let's just say five months. Maybe four months. She looks at you and says, by the way, do you have health insurance? And you say, oh, um, no, we have partial. Well, does that cover like, you know, pregnancy, labor and all that? Say, I got to go check. <laughs> And then you realize, well, no, you don't have full coverage. And all of a sudden, you know, it's like getting a slap in the face. Everything was going so good. Your fantasy had no cracks in it. <clears throat> she no longer really cares about your philosophy of life. She no longer cares about your history. She no longer cares about your perspective about this and that. A mother becomes all of a sudden a woman who 
potential is going to be a mother becomes very, very grounded suddenly and looks at you and says, well, you know, I love you, but you need to find the job that gives you full coverage. But still the fantasy of becoming a father, you know, blinds you to all the struggles you have to go through to find the job that gives you full coverage. And eventually you'll find a job and you're happy and you come home and you look at your wife and you say, or companions say, yes, we are covered. Okay. And then once in a while, when she is seven or eight or nine months pregnant, it's about 40 weeks, once in a while the kid is moving inside her belly and she grabs your hand and she says, look, look, she or he is moving. And man, it's exciting, you know. And then uh, you have a bag ready because at any time she could go into labor. And one day she says, Chris, I, I think it's time. What's happening? I think my water is about to break. You put her on your bike and you ride to Kaiser. And they give you a room. And uh, there comes a point where the contractions are very, very close. And after five or six or seven hours or maybe five minutes, depending on you know, the nature of the pregnancy and labor and all that, this thing comes out. And man, you're overjoyed. This is your child. Well, as a man, it's, it's a little weird because you feel like an outsider, but nevertheless, you're extremely happy. As your child, well, of course, what happens is the first few months is going to be a little difficult because this infant is going to need adjusting to a world that he or she has never seen or been or felt before. And let's just say you have a very, very healthy child. Your wife nurses him or her and she has gas the infant, and so at 2, 3 in the morning, you have to get up, pat her on the back, run around the house, hoping that she'll quiet down so you can get some rest. But it's the same thing day after day after day. You know, she cries all the time. And you come home, you're exhausted, you need some peace, but no peace is going to be given to you. Your wife is far too exhausted. And uh, you're looking forward to going home from eight or nine or 10 hour shift, hoping to find some peace. And uh, it's chaotic. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's lots of fun when you look at your child and he or she kind of looks at you and smiles and holds your finger and all that. But it is work. And then, you know, the first few times it's enjoyable waking up at two and then three and then four and then five, changing here you know, holding her, running around the house to quiet her down. But after a while, your body says, man, I'm exhausted, you know, and you need some rest. And so you realize the excitement of wanting to hold her and have a good time with her turns into some disastrous event. You get no rest. You get no peace. Your wife is in pain and she's exhausted. You're in pain and you're exhausted. You have no idea how to shut this kid up. And so you have this, you're in this conundrum, you know, you feel guilty, you feel bad, you feel angry, you're, you have all these emotions and you have no idea what to do with them. Now, let me add a footnote to this. If you happen to be 20 and you have a child, you have the energy and the patience and the stamina, hopefully, if you have come from a relatively good background, to kind of... Um, Withstand, you know, be okay with all the pressures of a family life. A child who's very, very young and a wife who's very exhausted. If you happen to be 30, going to school, having a full-time job, then having a wife, 
and a child and having to pay rent, utilities, food, it's far too much. And so <clears throat> you're going to have feelings and you're going to have thoughts you never had before. Why did I do this? Or was, I, was I crazy? How come my father didn't talk to me about this? How come my mother didn't talk to me about this? I went to school and no one in my you know, academic career ever spoke about the difficulties of parenthood, the difficulties of raising a child, the difficulties of being married. And so you realize that you've been betrayed by a culture, you've been betrayed by a system, by parents, by God. Everything you have read, everything you have thought about never made you ready, got you to this place where you can actually embrace the realities of life. And so you kind of feel very, very poor. You feel uneducated, you know. And that's going to make you feel really crappy for a long, long time. Then... Um, You notice something very interesting, which is your child doesn't really gravitate towards you as much. And that's, I think, for the most part, the universal theme that fathers have a very difficult time accessing their child. They're much more closer to their mother, and rightly so. She's the one who cooked them. She's the one who feeds them. She's the one who's home with them the entire day. They don't really see you. <coughs> and, you know, when the child is inside uh, your companion, this not yet born entity can smell things, can hear things. And most of it is connected to the oven, which is the mother. And so that is going to kind of create some sort of a resentment inside you, that here you are, you're doing all sorts of things for your kid, but you don't really have much access to her. Every time something goes wrong, he or she runs to the mother. Every time she wants something, he or she runs to the mother. And then you look at yourself and you say, well, it seems that I am simply here for one reason, to cook, to clean, to make money, to pay for this, to pay for that. That's really my function. And that is going to be the case for a while. Now, if you have been with your companion for a number of years and she has given you all of her attention, that's going to change. You're no longer interesting. You're no longer important. The only thing that matters to your companion now are the kids. That's the only thing, you know. And again, rightly so. These are her creation, you know, very much like God looking at his creation and then seeing Adam and Eve and say, he says to them, I've made everything for you guys. Nothing else really matters, you know, because my soul lives inside you. That's what God says to Adam and Eve. And in essence... When a woman gives birth to a child, her child, what she's saying is, my blood, my sweat, my soul lives inside this child. Everything that I am, everything that I have in this life belongs to this kid, is part of this kid. And you're waiting for her to look at you and say, Chris, you too, but that's not going to be the case you're going to be an outsider. She's not going to care for your philosophies of life. She's not going to care for anything you have to say about anything except where is your paycheck? Are we still going to have insurance? And <clears throat> good morning, Lena. Well, you... <laughs> Remember, um, going over a lot of important footnotes, you know, so fast forward. Let's say you're somewhat reflective. 
and uh, you realize you've had these friends for the past five or six or ten years. I mean, you know, they're nice people, but sometimes they smoke a bit too much, sometimes they drink a bit too much, sometimes they use foul language. But now you're a married man. Uh, you also have a companion. And you don't want to invite someone who keeps looking at your woman. And you certainly don't want to invite someone, hello Julian, you don't certainly want to invite someone who smells a little funny, who talks, you know, speaks bad language, because now you have a child. And the things you never considered before, all of a sudden you have no choice but to consider. <clears throat> now, you're not going to get much time to read, you're not going to get much time to think, because uh, someone has entered into your life that's invading all the spaces, inner as well as outer. You know, kids need to be active. And so you're going to spend about 90% of your time taking care of the house, taking care of your wife or companion, taking care of your kid. And that's not going to go well for you. First, because as a man, especially in this culture, you're profoundly independent. Your time belongs to you. No one has right to your time unless you're willing to give that time to them. This is not something you're doing willingly. Perhaps you did the first couple of months or weeks or years, but now that the kid is growing up, he or she demands more of your time, which means that the more time you give them, the less time you have for yourself. Now, if you have any addictions such as reading, and these are good addictions, reading a good book, thinking good thoughts, sitting and writing, those go out the window. Unless you have a wife or a companion who really, really understands what's going on inside you and says, yes, I've been home taking care of this kid for the past 10 hours. You just come home and I see that you're a bit reflective. So why don't you go into the study and sit there and think and write for another 10 hours. You don't have to see the kid today or tomorrow or next week. Finish your book. That's not going to happen. Okay. Now, do you know what happens when you have to give up your time? And your giving up is not of your willingness. You're forced to give up your time. That's going to create a good amount of resentment, anger. Again, remember, if you happen to be the sort of a fellow who sits back and says, time has value, life is short. I want to inject into this time things that really, really have value. I don't want to just sit and read the newspaper. I just don't want to sit and look at YouTube clips. I'm not into gossips. I want things to be meaningful. The problem with having a child is that there is nothing meaningful that you can give to your child. Your child wants Target. Your child wants soccer. Your child wants park. Your child wants <laughs> running around. So that in itself is going to piss you off. So for those of you in this class who are kids, and I guess all of us are, you should pause a little and uh, kind of consider the sacrifices that parents have made. You know. And now <clears throat> something really, really interesting is going to happen. Your time is being eaten by your child. Your wife has been swallowed up by your child. She doesn't give you attention. She doesn't give you time. She doesn't give you much attention or focus or anything. You have to figure out what to do with the fact that your wife pays you no attention. That in itself creates a good amount of inner hostility. And then you're going to look at this child and say, God damn it. They messed up my life. They took away my independence, my energy. As your wife becomes more attached to the kids, and that's what happens when the kids kind of grow up and you can see more of your own reflection inside your kid, the way you teach them, how they express the teachings back to you, you feel, you begin to feel more and more isolated and your conflicts with your companion begins. Consider what Freud said. There are things you want to do, and this is not really what Freud argued, this is what I'm saying, and uh, maybe Freud will just be raised from his grave, but 
There are things you want to do, but you can't do them because you're a family man now. And that's not going to go well for you. Now, you may have been very well socialized where you can keep your emotions calm and cool and collected and visible and hidden, but they will come out eventually. You will think about leaving. Leaving the relationship because it's too much. You don't want to be in it. You know. <clears throat> but then you feel guilty for doing so. You feel guilty for having those thoughts. You feel guilty for having emotions that create those thoughts. So you man up. But you don't man up because you understand the complexities. You man up because you feel guilty. You man up because you're just forced. Let's just say none of those things are true for you. And you love your wife, you love your child, despite the fact that no one pays you attention. Your child gets to be three or four or five. Then you say to yourself, I live in Oakland. It's a crappy place. It's dirty, smelly. The way it has defined diversity is just trash. You know, it's like when you go home and you have a Twinkie, then you have a hamburger, then you have milk, then you have ice cream, then you have French fries, and then you have diarrhea, and then you throw up. That's diversity. The other form of diversity is you go home, you make yourself a nice burger, lettuce, tomato, onions, some water, and then you look at uh, the plate and what's on it, you realize that it is diverse, but it is diverse in a very harmonious, healthy way, you know? And that particular diversity is really, really good. So you look at Oakland and you say, this kind of diversity is not something I like my kid to be exposed to. Then you say, okay, what am I supposed to do? گلی که خم به دادم پیچ و تابش زعاب دیدگونم دادم آبش به درگاه الهی که روابی گل از ما دیگری گیره گلابش How did this kid, this infant, turn to be three or four or five? You had a lot of sleepless nights. You gave your time and your life away to Home Depot, to Zachary's, to Laney College so you could make some money to feed him or her to give him a nice physical environment, to pay for rent, to pay for food, to pay for utility, to care, take care of your wife. Now it's time for your kid to leave you and enter society. You know, every parent is like the Buddha's parents. You don't want any harm to come to them. You don't want them to see old age. You don't want them to see sickness. You don't want them to see death. You don't want their psychology to be cracked just yet. You want to protect their innocence as much and as long as you can. And now your child, <clears throat> and then just, let's just say you live in a relatively difficult neighborhood where there is violence, it's dirty, it's messy, it's ugly, it's unattractive. People shout and scream, they play loud music. And you say, what the hell is this? I mean, these are things you never considered before. And now you want to move from, say, International and 40th to a place, let's say, let's say Montclair. And then you look at your finances and you realize you just don't have enough money. You don't make enough money. And you say, what should I do? Because remember, now that your child is old enough to enter society, it means that they're going to be conditioned, programmed, by society. Now, if you happen to be casual, if you just don't care because life has just pushed you around so much that you've grown to be callous, well, this doesn't really belong to you. If, on the other hand, regardless of how much society has tried to impose its ridiculous and absurd forces upon you, and you have held back, you know, kind of like the last scene or near the last scene of the movie, The Matrix, where bullets are you know, going towards him, and he says no, he stops them. 
<clears throat> and the bullets fall. If you happen to be that kind of a man where you have a child and you know the society is throwing all sorts of ridiculous gadgets at him and he's going to become contaminated, you know that at the age of five he's going to be addicted to porn, he's going to find weed interesting, he's going to find foul language interesting, you say no to all of that. But to say no, it's not enough for you to just say no. What you need to do is you need to physically, physically, Move into a different environment. You know, like, if you want to be a good Christian, for example, if you want to be a good student of philosophy, you move into a cultish environment. Not cult the way it's been defined today, but it's an underground movement. It's very clean. I mean, every, every movement has its own trash and garbage and contaminants and toxins. But let's just say you've moved into an underground movement that's 80% good and 20% bad. It's a good deal. It's much better than moving into a Jim Jones environment or a David Koresh environment. Now, <clears throat> you're going to be very, very, very upset with the fact that you don't have enough money. And you have a couple of choices. You either have to become slowly, gradually be cooked into becoming callous. So when your child comes home and uses profanities, Initially, you care, you scream, you shout, you throw a temper tantrum, you want to slap him, kick him, do something to make him stop using such language. But if you pay attention, like all of us, you know, the great analogy of a frog that is in a relatively lukewarm water, and then the water gets warm, then the water gets hot, then it gets to boil, but the frog doesn't feel any of that stuff because it's gradual. And before you know it, the frog that's just on top of the water is dead. And that's how parents eventually become. Initially, you fight against the forces of society because something about you knows society has a good amount of garbage in it. Now, let me make the story a little bit more complicated. And that's, for us, it's a bit more cultural. And if you happen to have come from a traditional background, that becomes your story, which is, if you happen to have a girl you are extremely protective. For the first time, you come to realize that how cunning, how deceptive, how vulturous men are. And that begins at the age of two. We don't trust any boys. You don't trust any man. Any man who looks at your daughter in a strange way, you're ready to slit their throat. Now, they may simply be you know, looking in a very, very innocent way, but that's not the way you feel as a father. <clears throat> and, you know, you need to kind of understand some of the cultural nuances because it is interesting. You know, when, as Persians, when we go to gatherings, part of the tradition that all of us kind of abided was that if there is a woman who has a companion in a gathering, Rarely do you shake their hands. Rarely do you look them in the eye because they belong to someone else. You don't want to create emotions uh, that makes their companion feel nervous or funny. Remember, despite all the hippie talks about open relationships and, you know, uh, free love and all that stuff, it doesn't work well for human beings. 